Uh, let's uh, let's talk first of all if we, uh, about the BBC. Obviously, it comes within your remit as shadow culture secretary. Um, Nadine Dorries, the culture secretary, has announced that the BBC license fee will be frozen. We're not going to see uh, a uh, an inflation uh, uh, style uh, increase uh, because, of course, the cost of living crisis is affecting everyone right now with energy bills and general wide inflation. Uh, and also, the plan is that if the Tory Party is still in power in 2028, then this will be the last license fee uh, deal that is done, and their new form of funding will be found in the year of Netflix and uh, Amazon Prime and the like of it. Um, what's wrong with that decision? Well, you say announced it. Um, you know, it's a massive uh, policy shift, a massive policy uh, decision. Uh, the BBC has been funded in a way that it's been funded for 100 years this year. It celebrates the centenary. And she's, she's so, so-called announced it with a, a, with a half-hearted tweet uh, last, uh, last night on, on Twitter. So... That isn't announcing uh, anything, in, in my view. Uh, but look, I mean, you, you're absolutely right. We do have to, to balance here, I think, uh, fairness and value to the licence fee payer with ensuring that the BBC can continue to do uh, what it does uh, so well and what makes it so distinctive from uh, other kind of uh, broadcast or streaming services. So things like local journalism, local uh, fact finding that that we can't find any anywhere else. The World Service that gives us great soft power and you know uh, promotes global Britain around the world. A huge educational package that a lot of our young people rely on uh, there as well. And they, and they also support the creative industries more broadly in in this country by making uh, great programmes as part of that bigger mix, as you say, of other broadcasts, other. Uh, providers as well but but the the BBC is renowned around the world and, and our uh, model our unique model that we have this mix of public and private in this country which has really accelerated our creative industries is known around the world and you know with one simple tweet the culture secretary I think is performing cultural vandalism it's the only way to describe it she's, she's offered no plan for the future for the BBC she's just said that's it well, you say cultural vandalism. Lots of people say this is political payback. Uh, this is an attack on the BBC for their criticisms of the, the Conservative Party for years of, of uh, people would say, perceived political bias. I don't think it's a perception. I think it's blatantly obvious. And I've walked into the BBC often enough and know enough people who work there to know exactly where uh, where an awful lot of their staff's uh, allegiances lie, whether it's about big issues like Brexit uh, uh, or, or on uh, on their party political allegiances. Um I mean, is is it the wrong decision because of the way it was announced and because it's perceived as being a you know, part of the dead cat strategy on the the, the lock uh, on lockdown party gate? Um, and we'll come to that um, and and political payback. Or is it the wrong decision because the BBC for some reason needs three and a half billion pounds of your and my money at a time when people are really struggling financially and uh, and, and they need that money desperately to produce what they do. I'm I'm not I'm not anti BBC. I don't even want the BBC to be to be closed down. I'm quite happy for some element of public funding. But they don't really need to do all that they do. I mean, we'll still have pop music played without the BBC having Radio One. We'll still have cartoons and things without CBBS, and we'll we'll still have drama made without the BBC. Unless you've not seen Netflix in the last few years. So, what is it that they do that's so amazing and brilliant and unique that we couldn't possibly cope without it? Well, look. I mean, the first thing I say, Julia, in response to uh, some of your er- earlier part of your question is that you know, editorially the, the BBC irritates me I'm sure as, as it does the next politician and uh, but that doesn't change my view about the value and, and you're absolutely right you know it's absolutely clear that this is part of this so-called red meat or dead meat uh, strategy uh, of, of the government of of thinking of things that they can announce over these few days that will cause a a huge distraction because they want to blame everybody else but themselves. So now, of course, it's the BBC's fault for the way in which they interview people or the headlines that they uh, come up with uh, on the six o'clock or 10 o'clock news rather than the prime minister's uh, fault at all. And and that's completely wrong-headed. And and it's supposed to be in service, so we, we understand, of their real desire to address the cost of living crisis. Well, why aren't they addressing the real cost of living crisis here? You know, energy bills we're hearing going to be going up by 50 percent for some people on, on, on very low incomes, going up by tens of pounds a month, hundreds of pounds a year. Rent at its highest it's been uh, ever and, and soaring continually. Travel costs are going up, petrol costs are going up, 
food costs going up all by tens of tens of pounds a month. The license fee, as you say, it's around about thirteen pounds fifty odd uh, a month, and it, you know even kind of a small increase, which I'm not necessarily advocating, but even a small increase would be pence, a few pence a month. Yeah, but it's, oh, so but it's pence that I people are forced that the... to pay. That's the difference. Whether you use any of the services, now, it's a lot cheaper than Netflix, but that's not the point. The point, the point is that people choose to have uh, a, a, uh, a contract with Netflix or Amazon Prime or Sky, whoever. They don't get to choose about the BBC. You can watch no BBC programmes whatsoever. The, uh, the owning of a television itself requires you... Um, to uh, to buy a, a TV license fee on pain of going to prison if you don't pay it and then don't pay a fine. That is very, very different from saying it's such... I mean, we keep hearing this argument. It's such good value. It's 43 pence a day. If it's such good value and it's so good, well, then millions of people will pay to subscribe to it. You don't need to force people to. Well, look, I mean, people are, are, are very, 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 very rarely uh, sort of prosecuted in, in, in that sense. Anyway. People are very rarely but prosecuted. Just, let, no, 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 ten, no, 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 Lucy, 10 percent of cases in magistrate courts are for non-payment of the BBC licence fee. Can, can I just answer your, your wider point, which is that as part of our creative industries, our broadcast uh, mix, uh, as I say, for 100, 100 years, what, what the BBC does with its licence fee is, is the provision of lots of things that nobody else would provide because they're not commercially viable. So all those local radio stations, you know, with the demise of local newspapers, if you want to find out about local news happening in your area, I don't know, a flooding incident, a traffic accident, something that's happening in a, in a local school, your local um, BBC radio station, sorry to say, uh, you know, is often uh, the source mm. of that. Uh, actually, the B, the B, actually, the, the, actually the, the BBC has actually, they have actually crowded out. Their resources have meant they've been able to crowd out all of the local newspapers that, that did exist and all the local no, news I, that well, did I don't exist. Think, I don't, I that don't is actually right. what's I don't, I, don't think that's, I don't think that's right. I think they're the last people there who are able to support uh, local, local journalism in that way. We've also got the huge educational... Offer. I mean, CBB, CBBC, uh, as well as their sort of content, it's not far from uh, cartoons, very educational. Lots of people rely on that for their youngsters to watch, but in particularly the bite size offer, the education offer. When this government during the pandemic couldn't even get an iPad to most young people who were locked up at home with the school closed, it was BBC bite size, it was the BBC that came in and actually educated our young people for, for many weeks when the government uh, couldn't yeah. they don't they do don't that. need three so, and a half billion to do it there look let's move well, let's let's move let's move on and let's talk about other issues because again a lot of this has been seen as a strategy to divert attention from from the real issue which is party gate all of these lockdown parties it appears to me that, i mean the latest revelation in the mirror yet another leaving do i mean when were they not having parties is the question sue gray is apparently the the senior cab, um, cabinet officer um, second permanent secretary has interviewed the prime minister about time too we're maybe another week or two away from getting her report but there's also claims about Keir Starmer. I mean, it's an old story. It made back onto the front pages, bizarrely, months on, of Keir Starmer uh, having a drink in April last year uh, during a by-election campaign. Um, do you think that um, all the politicians have questions to answer or do you think that the Keir Starmer story is also another attempt to divert attention away from what happened in Number 10? I do, yeah. I think it's another attempt to try and tar everybody with the same brush because that's the the best hope the government have got now is that all politicians are saying you're just as as bad as each other. And I don't think uh, you're breaking in between uh, working in a constituency office uh, with a small number of people, as Keir Starmer was, breaking in the middle of, of that work for a spontaneous uh, bite to eat in the, in the kitchen is the same as anything like the same as the industrial scale organised uh, quite large gatherings with uh, pre invites to them, bring your own bottle, trestle tables put up, uh, a new wine fridge bought because they were so prolific and happening all the time, that on an industrial scale. But not only that, but the months and months of, of lies and cover-ups that we've seen about it as well. There's been no fessing up. Uh, you know, had this initially been the case of the Prime Minister said, oh, look, I put my hands up. Yes, we were in the middle of, of work. We broke away for something to eat. It happened once. I'm really sorry about that. But, you know, I think um, all would have been forgiven, actually, largely. But that's not what we've seen. We've seen revelation after revelation, denial after denial, lie after lie, cover up after cover up. 
which has meant now that nobody really believes a word that the Prime Minister is, is saying on this anymore and they don't believe uh, what's coming out of it. And that's why he's lost public trust and, and that's why we believe he's, he's unable to, to govern and do uh, the, the difficult things that the country needs doing right now, such as addressing the, the real cost of living crisis. I know that's what most of my constituents want to hear me okay. talking about and everybody else talking um, about. I know you've got another interview to get to. Just one final question. Do you think the Prime Minister survives this? I don't know. He shouldn't survive it and he should do the honourable thing for himself. And I think his, his Tory colleagues should should, uh, should push him if he doesn't jump. Lucy Powell, appreciate you joining us. Uh, Shadow Culture Secretary, Labour MP, of course. Well, let's get the thoughts of Alan Tolhurst, Chief Reporter at Politics Home. Um, there's no doubt at all there's a lot of cynicism around, I think rather understandably, about um, the announcement about the BBC, uh, the announcements about you know, the, the military going to be taking over, dealing with things of the Channel migrants, um, apparently a big you know, um, operation to try and tackle uh, the backlog in NHS operations. So this huge backlog, we've, we've now got six million people on, on the waiting list there. Um, but a lot of cynicism that this is all about um, basically the Operation Red Meat, as we've been hearing, policies to sort of appeal to those particular Red Wall uh, MPs and their voters. But also it's all part of Operation Save Big Dog, as we're told. I mean, extraordinary name title. Um, basically, Save Boris Johnson, sacking senior figures at number 10, blaming them for everything, whether they're civil servants or whether they're his own special advisers. A bit of a reshuffle having apparently a no booze uh, rule in number 10. I mean, uh, by the way, like most offices and workplaces, do you think any of this is going to be enough to save Boris Johnson's bacon? I'm not, I'm not sure. I think one of the things that I found most interesting about the list of policies that, uh, that, that the government is, is set to announce as part of this red meat, essentially it just seems like uh, a list of policies that they should have been doing anyway. Essentially, yeah. like he seems to be kickstarted into actually just doing his job effectively one of the one of the things that they're going to they're going to they're going to announce the the leveling up white paper well that's something they should have done a year ago 18 yeah. months ago it was a big plank of their election winning strategy so i think what's in a sense what this might have done you know is is actually almost in a sense draw attention to the fact that the government hasn't actually been getting on with yeah. the business of government and again, itself. also this idea that whatever the problem, whether it's the NHS, whether it's you know, vaccine rollout, whether it's migrants crisis, whatever it is, the solution is always bring in the military. I, to me, that simply says we we don't know how to do things in government. That's what I hear. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting. And, and I think um, one of one of the, there's a famous sort of journalistic story is that you, you can always write whatever you like. You can always write the story that the SAS are on standby yeah. to help. Because simply the SAS's entire job is to be on standby, <laughs> yeah. to step in. And actually, it doesn't really associate, it doesn't really deal with what should have been going on and how should they be being, being helped. And, and yeah, and I think, you know, the the, uh, the military is at its lowest level of numbers in terms of troops and, and other mm. members of staff in about 150 years. So the idea they're going to be able to help out all the stuff anyway, it seems yeah. to be for the birds. So yeah. I don't really think it's, it's, it's very useful. And actually, they should just be getting on with the business of government in general. Indeed. Well, we'll uh, talk more about that throughout. We're going to be talking latest royal news involving Prince Andrew and Prince Harry up next with our royal correspondent and the latest on Novak Djokovic as well deported from Australia but he could be back for the Australian Open next year because the rules are different if you're a top sportsman we always knew that didn't we 719 is the time this is talk radio